Yeah. Cut the jazz. Good afternoon, everyone here at Riggs Library. Good afternoon, everyone online. My name is Joel Hellman. I'm Dean of the School of Foreign Service. Welcome here this afternoon. Um, I want to say how lucky this group of students is. I can tell you that we are having great difficulties across the campus because two of our most important rooms, Gaston and Copley, are offline for us. Um, and as a result, um, we had to turn away literally hundreds of students who um, requested the effort to be here. So I'm glad that you guys made it. I hope others who weren't able to make it are online um, to hear this important conversation. This is perhaps um, the most consequential period in U.S.-Russian relations uh, in my generation. And I started studying the Soviet Union um, in college. So I've been looking at this part of the world for a very, very long time. It is, of course, on the cusp of the anniversary, um, a sad anniversary, uh, of the horrific invasion, Russian invasion of a sovereign nation, unprovoked. Um, uh, but uh, an extraordinary surprise to the world um, of the implications of that in invasion, both for U.S. relationships with our allies and the unified response, um, the incredible bravery and courageousness of the Ukrainian people in response to this horrific invasion. Um, and, uh, and, and I think also the beginning of a deep rethinking of the nature of the global order in response to this kind of tragic uh, invasion. We are fortunate amidst um, this very sad occasion, though, to be graced on our presence, um, on our campus, uh, with someone who has been deeply involved and deeply engaged um, in the history, uh, recent history of our relationship with Russia. Uh, and the inaugural event with Ambassador John Sullivan, who is now a distinguished fellow here at the School of Foreign Service and at the Center for Eurasian, Russian, and East European Studies. Uh, as you know, uh, Ambassador Sullivan served as U.S. Ambassador to Russia from 2019 to 2022 under two U.S. presidents. He was former U.S. Deputy, US Deputy Secretary of State, um, and he had a four decade career in public service under five different presidents. Um, so really one of our most distinguished senior public servants in the United States, and we're so privileged to have him here, to give us his views, his perceptions, and his experience um, in dealing with this sort of tremendous challenge. And interviewing, of course, is another great um, uh, citizen of Georgetown, uh, Professor Angela Stent. She's now emeritus professor of government at Georgetown, although given what's been going on around the world, she is here as much as she has ever been um, engaging with us. She's former director of our Center on Eurasian, Russian, and East European Studies. She's a senior fellow at Brookings, a former national intelligence officer of, for Russia and Eurasia, um, and also, of course, the author of Putin's World, Russia Against the, the West and with the Rest. Um, which presaged a lot of the things that we're sort of seeing. So we are going to have a moderated conversation, an open conversation between um, Professor Stent uh, and Ambassador John Sullivan. Um, they'll speak for about 30 minutes or so, and then they'll open it up for questions from the audience here. Um, those online will be able to watch, um, but the audience here will be able to ask questions. So we really look forward to their words of wisdom at this difficult moment, um, and we look forward to the conversation. Let me welcome Professor Stent and Ambassador Sullivan to the stage. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to people in the room and to all of those online. I'm just delighted to be interviewing um, Ambassador Sullivan, for whom I have great respect. Um, yesterday, some of you may have seen that his successor, Ambassador Lynn Tracy, just arrived in Moscow last week, and she went to the foreign ministry in Moscow yesterday, where she was greeted by a crowd of Russians yelling, America is a terrorist state. So that's the situation that we're in at the moment. Um, I don't know what her expectations were before she went there, but she, of course, had been uh, the DCM at the embassy, and so she probably knew what she was walking into. Uh, and that reminded me that just before Ambassador Sullivan went out to Moscow, uh, he met with a group of us, 
uh, and we were talking about his expectations. And I remember him saying he really understood it was a very difficult situation. This is now the end of 2019, the beginning of 2020. Um, but that people-to-people -people diplomacy was very important. He's a great hockey fan. The Russians are great hockey fans. And so he hoped that through the medium of hockey and other things like that, um, he could interact with the, with the Russian public and find a, a better way maybe of uh, putting, uh, progressing in uh, US-Russian relations. So I guess my first question to you is, what were your expectations before you went out to Moscow? What did you hope to accomplish? It was a different time then. Obviously, as Deputy Secretary of State, you already had met with a number of the people that, with whom you were going to interact. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Professor Sten. Angela, it's, it's good to be with you and everyone here uh, in the Riggs Library. I've been here once before to speak when I was Deputy Secretary. This is quite a, uh, or an ornate, beautiful, uh, beautiful site. Uh, reminds me of some of the venues I spoke at in Moscow. Uh, and uh, so it was a different time in, in more ways than one. So I was confirmed in December of 2019, Donald Trump was president. Um, he, he had this idea that he would have, through his personal relationship with President Putin, that he could, uh, he could turn that, uh, what was a very troubled, obviously, relationship between the United States and Russia to his advantage. It was not unique. Um, in President Trump's approach to world leaders, he did the same thing with, um, you know, with G, with Modi, with Erdogan, uh, but with Putin, it got a lot of uh, press here, and I won't go into the, you know, the 2016 election and so forth. But there was a perception in Moscow that Trump was not necessarily on their side, but in a better place with respect to Russia than many other Americans, including the new ambassador. I was chided by Foreign Minister Lavrov. Uh, in, a, in a bilateral meeting I had with him while I was still deputy secretary about my confirmation hearing and all the mistakes I'd made in my testimony and the false accusations and this preposterous idea that there had been any interference in the U.S. elections, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but make no mistake about it, <clears throat> the U.S.-Russia relationship when I arrived as ambassador um, th more than three years ago now was in, uh, in bad, bad shape. Uh, we had expelled 60 Russian diplomats from the United States in the spring of 2018 after the, uh, the use by the GRU of the Novichok ner nerve agent in Salisbury in an attempt to assassinate um, uh, the Skripal, uh, a former uh, Russian intelligence officer election interference, you name it. My expectations for where we were gonna go with our relationship were very low. My standard talking point was um, we have reached, we've reached a low point in post-Cold War US-Russia relations and we need to stop digging the hole we're in. And I was mimicking what um, my, the first secretary I worked for, Secretary Rex Tillerson, said on his one and only trip to Moscow, he said that very thing in a, uh, in a press conference with Foreign Minister Lavrov. Uh, so I went there with low expectations, but with a, uh, a desire to work hard, to make a good personal impression on uh, both my Russian interlocutors at the MFA and across uh, the Russian government, but with the Russian people as well, to the extent that they would, the Russian government would let me speak with them. So as 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 Angela said, I had uh, you know I did hockey events. I did. I spoke to law students. I'm, my background is I'm a lawyer. Uh, I'm not sure why they let me do this, uh, but the Russian government allowed me to speak. It was only virtually, but um, virtually to hundreds of law students from all the law schools in the greater Moscow area and faculty members. And it was terrific. I had a wonderful exchange with, uh, particularly with the law students online, comparing notes about what it was like to be a law student in the United States, what it's like to be a law student in, uh, in Russia. Uh, but as bad as relations were in, at the start of January 2020, they were on a precipitous decline. Uh, because you'll recall that in January of 2020, uh, 
Putin announced that he was replacing the then Prime Minister Medvedev uh, with uh, his tax guy, uh, the now Prime Minister Mishustin. Um, constitutional reforms that would uh, eliminate, not eliminate, but would be would ger be gerrymandered in such a way to allow Putin to run for re-election two more times, even though he was term limited, two more six-year terms, which would allow him to serve if he lived and wanted to, to serve until 2036, a crackdown on civil society, media, uh, NGOs, and so forth. It was a precipitous decline, and we were already headed downhill when I got there. So I guess the next question is, yes, all the constitutional changes there. Um, how did the COVID lockdown affect, first of all, your work and your relationships with your Russian counterparts? And I do have to ask you this because everyone asks this, right? How do you think it affected Vladimir Putin personally? <laughs> yeah. Well, it was, I can tell you uh, from personal experience that it hit the Ministry of Foreign Affairs hard. Mm -hmm. um, the ministry has, of course, Foreign Minister Lavrov. I think there are 10 or 11 deputy foreign ministers. I used to joke with my principal interlocutor, Sergei Rybkov, I used to joke with him, you know, with famous missile gap between the United States and the Soviet Union, particularly during the 1960 presidential campaign. I, sa I said there was a deputy secretary, deputy minister gap. We have only one deputy secretary, but they have got 10. And uh, Sergei's a good a good, uh, you know, a good professional, and he, we, we joked about that. But Sergey, I think every one of the deputy foreign ministers mm -hmm. was hospitalized with COVID, S many of them twice. Yeah. Uh, now, part of that was um, any senior official who got COVID and had any symptoms was sent to the hospital. Uh, Lavrov was hospitalized twice. Uh, once had a very, he was out for a while. He had a, he had a serious uh, case of, uh, of, uh, of COVID. Vladimir Vladimirovich, uh, you know, we've all seen how he was, he uh, conducted business uh, during the pandemic, you know, visiting officials who had to walk through a lengthy, uh, you know, mist tunnel with mist of, of disinfectants that were sprayed on them and having to isolate for a, a, a long period of time um, before they were allowed access to the president, sitting at a great distance from him. Uh, and he limited, of course, the number of people he met. So he was isolated. There's no doubt about that. I have no indication that he was ever infected, tested positive, was sick, uh, but he might have been but he was definitely isolated. He was definitely isolated, and uh, you know he spends a lot more time than the Russian government acknowledges in Sochi, and not just in Sochi, but on his yacht or yachts in the Black Sea, or at least he did before the war started. Yeah. That's one uh, <laughs> nice thing that Vladimir Vladimirovich has to be a little more cautious taking his yacht out in the Black Sea these days because one of those harpoon missiles that uh, the Ukrainians have might, uh, that would be a pretty bold stroke. Um, but he, uh, yeah, he's, he was isolated. How much it affected his thinking and his thinking about the, the special military operation, hard to say. Mm -hmm. uh, but I found it was difficult for me, particularly in the first year of the pandemic, to get physical access to any Russian leaders. There was a pretty hard lockdown in Moscow starting at the end of March of 2020 uh, into the summer. It had to end, though, for an artificial reason, and that was they had to celebrate um, Victory Day, the 75th anniversary of, of the victory in the Great Patriotic War. They couldn't have the parade on what is Victory Day in, in, in Russia, May 9th. They had to postpone it, and they postponed it. They picked a date six weeks later, five weeks later, at the end of April, how they, you know, I remember thinking at the time, <laughs> how do they know, and they picked June 24th, how do they know that it's gonna be safe to have the parade on June 24th? Yeah. Well, because we say so. <laughs> uh, so we were planning for uh, planning for the parade. The, um, we had to convince, 
President Trump that, well, the president wasn't going to come, but he wanted high-profile leaders to go, and eh, that's not a good idea. Uh, so the uh, consensus was that I would attend, and I did. So I was playing, obviously paying very close attention to the preparation for the parade on, on Victory Day. And lo and behold, June 10th, exactly two weeks, 14 days before the parade, surprise announcement from Mayor Sobyanin of Moscow. Why, we've seen a decrease in infections. This is remarkable. We've really, we've overcome this. We knew we Russians were hardy folk and this was, we've overcome it. So I think we can do the parade on June 24th. And oh, by the way, right after the parade was the, the plebiscite they had, the, the vote they had on the constitutional reforms that would allow Putin to serve for, uh, for two more six-year terms. So, I mean, they manipulated, they manipulated their COVID statistics. It was much worse than they ever let on. The number of, you you've saw the news reports, any doctors who suggested that the pandemic wasn't being as handled as well as one might think from reading official government uh, reports, needed to stay away from open windows at hospitals. There was a large, I, honestly, four, five, six prominent medical professionals who met their deaths mysteriously falling out of windows at hospitals. Um, and of course, Sputnik was a farce. Sputnik was announced in July of 2020 mm -hmm. as efficacious, the greatest, I mean, it was almost Trump-like, the greatest vaccine ever, you know, it was really pretty shocking. And what it did was it undermined public, because everybody knew it was baloney, yeah. but it undermined public confidence in, uh, in the vaccine. It wasn't, turned out to be not as good, as efficacious as other vaccines, but uh, it's an example of what I describe as, what I what I I internalized from my experience in Russia was this great tragedy. This is a country with scientists and medical professionals mm -hmm. who could have made uh, enormous contributions to the global response to this awful pandemic, and instead, their work was manipulated by their government for political purposes, and it's it's tragic. Yeah. Um, let me ask you a little bit about. So when they came out of the um, lockdown from COVID, comparing your contacts with your high level contacts with people in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs before the invasion in February of 22 and after. So um, before February 24th, 2022, put the pandemic to one side. I have absolutely no complaint about my access to senior Russian government officials. I, with a couple of exceptions, I was sure you wouldn't meet with me because Mattis wouldn't meet with Ambassador Antonov okay. um, and had made it pretty clear, maybe even said something dismissive mm -hmm. about, uh, about not wasting his time uh, meeting with, uh, with any Russians, let alone uh, the lowly ambassador uh, from, from the Russian Federation. So Shoigu was out, um, but I met with everyone else I wanted to. I met with Patrushov. Mm -hmm. um, I had a meeting, although he sanctioned, with Igor Sechin of, uh, mm -hmm. of Rosneft. To I, I went to discuss issues involving Rosneft in Venezuela. It, there, there's, a, there's a funny story there, but you, we can, I can tell that later if you wanted, want my stand-up Russian comedy routine. Um, <laughs> Why don't you tell it now? <laughs> so he presented me with a gift. So I went to speak with him about Venezuela. And what Rosneft... maybe tell all the students that Igor Sechin is the head of Rosneft. Rosneft. And, <laughs> and a formidable man, right? <laughs> a, 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 from Leningrad, roughly the same age as President Putin, KGB trained with Putin, uh, very close to the Russian president, and now the CEO of Rosneft, the huge Russian oil, and oil company. And uh, I went there to talk about Rosneft providing, uh, or its economic relationship with Petavesa, the Venezuelan uh, oil company. And this was common in my, in my interactions with senior Russian government officials. I would have a very precise topic I wanted to discuss, and they never believed me that I, I actually had something to talk about. They always interpreted any outreach I did as, oh, the United States, they're coming to their senses. 
They finally want to engage with us. They want to admit they've been wrong. They will atone for their sins and we'll start doing more business together. I was there to talk about Rosneft not doing business in Venezuela. He wanted to present a slide deck to me that could have been prepared. It looked like it had been prepared, although it wasn't because they comply with, uh, with sanctions, by Goldman Sachs. He was giving me an economic presentation on uh, how efficient Rosneft's production is, why can't we be doing more business together, and that wasn't what I, what I was there to talk about. But he presented me with a gift, and it was an enormous, it's, it's about the size of this table, a, an enormous red leather-bound book, you know, with one of those locks mm -hmm. that come on, red leather with gold leaf, and I'm sure it was real gold. Real gold. And it was um, Karl Marx's Das Kapital. <laughs> <laughs> and he's got assistants who bring it in, and I didn't want to touch it. So I'm like looking at it, and he's got a sense of humor, right? So I thought, okay. What he did was, so I didn't want to touch it. It went off to the side of the room, and I thought I had ignored it sufficiently when I left. Wow, I don't have to explain why I'm bringing back what was clearly an expensive object from a sanctioned uh, Russian, notorious Russian uh, person. Uh, and because he's KGB trained, he knew what I was thinking. He had his assistants go down to my bodyguards and say, oh, Ambassador Sullivan wants to take this with him. They put it in the trunk of my car and brought it back to the goddamn embassy. And I had to say to diplomatic <laughs> security, I'm so sorry. I don't want to touch this thing. Can you please scan it? In any event, it was clean. It didn't have listening devices in it. But ah. <laughs> it was, uh, the Rus Russians have a great sense of humor. Many of the Russians, <laughs> including those who were, have reputations as the most formidable gangsters uh, around, <laughs> but, um, so anyway, access. Right. I got to meet anybody I wanted okay. to, basically, mm -hmm. with a few exceptions. Mm -hmm. Shoigu was one, the Ministry of Defense was one, um, because they didn't like the way their government was treated by, uh, by our Pentagon, by our, really OSD, because General Dunford, and then after that, General Milley, mm -hmm. did have contacts with uh, Colonel General Garasimov. And I met Garasimov, mm -hmm. uh, but not Shoigu. And how about after February 24th? Nothing. Nothing, okay. Only the MFA. Okay. Only the MFA, and uh, only with Ryabkov. Uh, and they would respond. Um, if I requested a meeting, and I, obviously I would go if they, if they wanted to speak with me, and there were occasions they summoned me to the MFA. Uh, President Biden said at a press conference, uh, I think he agreed that uh, Russian military had committed war crimes, and they summoned me to admonish me that the U.S. president shouldn't speak about Russia and the Russian president in those terms. Um, so, but it was restricted to, it's, it's more like, it wasn't quite as bad as Lynn's treatment yesterday, my, my successor, Lynn Tracy, who got a, uh, you know, a crowd of people with signs chanting slogans against the United States on her inaugural meeting at, uh, at the MFA. I never had that. Uh, after February 24th, the only organized protests, there were occasional organized protests outside the U.S. Embassy, but they were done to be videotaped. They would, people would arrive, they had clearly been, uh, you know, I'm sure they were being paid, showed up at a particular time, stayed for 45 minutes, organized themselves however, you know, the, the Russian government wanted them organized, however the video shot was going to be. They'd bring a camera out, they'd tape everything, and then they'd go, they'd, they'd pull up in a whole bunch of cars, the people would go back to their cars and, and drive home. It was never, obviously, there, there are no spontaneous protests anymore in, in Russia, in Moscow. If there are, the people who engage in them are pretty quickly uh, arrested and, and, uh, and sent away. We had one... This is a, a, just a, an, an anecdote. It was, it was in many ways uh, a scary uh, example of how effective they can be in, uh, in stopping protests. It was during uh, the George Floyd protests here, so May, June of 20, mm -hmm. uh, and some Russians, I believe they were Russians, wanted to have a unfurl a banner outside the U.S. Embassy that said something like justice for, uh, for Floyd. Uh, and we noticed 
unusual activity around the embassy by the FSB, we assume they were the FSB, uh, from early in the morning. And what are they doing? Are they, you know, something's going on. They're always poking and looking for ways to get access to, uh, to the embassy or put us under stress. There was something going on with you know, people leaning next to, to telephone poles that they were you know, smoking cigarette after cigarette. Why are they lingering there? Well, <clears throat> car pulls up in the middle of the afternoon. Three guys get out. They've got a banner that's rolled up, and they start walking up the sidewalk. And I've seen the videotape, and it happens in seconds. A white van pulls up. A whole bunch of people get out of the van. They took, and it was it was really, it was almost like ballet. They took those three protesters, threw them in the van, and disappeared in seconds. So our, the head of diplomatic, our diplomatic security at the embassy went down, and there were some FSB officers who were lingering after after uh, this this event. And he asked, he started asking them what had happened. And they said, well, we knew this, there was going to be a protest. We're doing this for you, the United States. Get, uh, pick these guys up. And he asked them, what, what's this crew? Who was this? And they, he described it. The, the, the FSB officer said it's our, his words, our flying squad. What that means is the people who show up in a van and you get thrown into it. And God knows what happens to you after that. <laughs> Um, so let's just talk a little bit about the war. At what point did you become convinced that Russia was going to have this full-scale invasion of Ukraine? Or did you think, like many people, that it was only going to be partial? So I knew in December or earlier, in November, mm. that there was going to be an invasion. I think yeah. President Biden said in a press conference, this was probably in 2022, closer to the February yep. 24th, that maybe it's a limited incursion. Mm -hmm. uh, but so um, we went, I was on home leave in uh, end of October of 2021 mm -hmm. when I got called to a meeting at the State Department. We had a civets with the White House. There was a presentation on uh, what the intelligence community said was this extremely unusual activity. It was indicating that Russia was going to invade, really invade Ukraine. There had been a military buildup in southwestern <coughs> Russia in the spring of 21. There was some disagreement, particularly with our, our uh, intelligence agencies. The UK MI6 was a little more forward-leaning, thought there might be an incursion by the Russian military in Ukraine. There wasn't. This time it was different. Uh, the president sent... Um, Ambassador, CIA Director Bill Burns to Moscow. Because I was home, I actually got to travel with Bill, uh, went to the meetings he had where um, the New York Times did a great job covering this in a, in a piece uh, in December, I guess, or some weeks ago um, in the, in the run-up to the war. Um, we spoke, Burns spoke, I remember vividly, he had a meeting with Patrushov, Secretary of the Security Council, laying out, not in great detail, but the basic message was, we see what you're going to do. If you do it, the consequences will be severe. Nothing like, much more significant than what happened in 2014-15. So by then, that's November 2nd. I knew something bad was going to happen. When I saw the number of troops that they had moved into Belarus, end of January, mm -hmm. I said, this is going to be a full-scale invasion. They are going to move south out of Belarus. If you look at a map, Kiev is, is just not that far south of the, uh, the border with Belarus. There's, there's a logistical problem with that in that the Chernobyl exclusion zone <coughs> stands between the Belarusian border and Kiev. Uh, but when I saw, I thought they were going to envelop uh, Ukraine. I said that. Uh, I expected, I started saying this in early February, there was going to be um, a, a wide scale, full bore Russian invasion of Ukraine. And as the month wore on, I was more and more convinced. It was difficult, though, to get people to, uh, to believe it. They understood that we had these reflections in, you know, satellite images and so forth, but it was just so irrational for uh, for the Russians, for Putin to do this on a large scale. 
Uh, he couldn't possibly. What I mean, it just all the things that subsequently happened. His risking that he wouldn't do it. He's too smart for that. Well, he wasn't. So we know that deterrence failed here. We also know that in December, right, the U.S. we took seriously the proposals the Russians put forward, nego you know, trying to negotiate with them. Do you think anything could have been done to stop this invasion? Um, no, uh, and. Um, Others in my in uh, in government, the U.S. government may have taken seriously the Russian proposals. I was there at MFA. Ryabkov handed two draft treaties to me. Uh, one was a draft uh, treaty purporting to be between the United States and Russia, and the other was between NATO and Russia. Um, as we used to say back in the day, when I was a young lawyer or a law firm associate, when people still used dictaphones, they were dictated but not read. I mean, this was sloppy to the nth degree. Mm -hmm. uh, the usual protocol is if we were to exchange, a, if we were to present a draft of a document like this to the Russian government, we will present it in English, our language, uh, and we would present a courtesy copy in Russian mm -hmm. for them to read as well. And they, <laughs> I've, I've sat there many times while my counterparts on the other side at MFA would go over our unofficial, by the way, unofficial translation into Russian and criticize our Ramon yet, yet, and go through it. <laughs> uh, you know, this is, that was just a courtesy copy for you, the official versions in English. Anyway, they present me these two short documents, dictated but not read, Russian wish, wish list for its, its security. Mm -hmm. In Russian only, and oh, by the way, Mr. Ambassador, this was a Wednesday, um, we want to begin negotiating these documents with you in two days in Geneva. How about it? <laughs> so my, you know, my wise guy instinct was to say, well, why wait? How about right now? And thinking that would really short, short their circuits, right? But I, I'll probably gotten me fired by President Biden. Uh, but no one who was serious about negotiation would have presented right. those sloppy documents in that manner and say, we're going to make these public on Friday. If you want to be there in Geneva and negotiate them with us, fine. If not, you're not serious about diplomacy. I came back to the embassy, and the White House asked me my opinion. And I said, the Russian government just said to President Biden. But for the next two months, we continue with to engage with them, because we had to, on their security concerns. Yeah. I'm going to ask you one more question, then we'll turn to the audience. Um, and that's, of course, about the prisoner exchange, Brittany Griner, and then about Paul Whelan, who's still in prison in Russia, about your experiences in dealing with the Russians uh, and how they approach this, how they make their decisions in terms of who they release and whom they don't. Right, right. Well, they distinguish between and among the Americans who were wrongfully detained. Paul Whelan, they put in a different category because they say uh, falsely that Paul is, was a, a US spy, he was not. Uh, but because they believe, they alleged he was a spy, he was handled exclusively by the FSB. He was held in La Fort of a prison, not in the usual pretrial detention facility, CISO 5, which is where I went to meet, for example, with Trevor Reed, who wasn't charged with espionage, he was charged with simple assault, uh, he didn't commit an assault. Um, we can get into that later. But the distinction excuse me, I want to draw is for Paul, the FSB was in charge. He was, in, he was prosecuted in a secret court with secret evidence by an FSB judge. That's how the judge was known. It was the same courthouse that other criminal cases are tried, but this courtroom, the FSB judge mm -hmm. presides in. And I'm a lawyer, I've been in many courtrooms in the United States, and I was actually allowed into the courtroom, met the judge, to ask the judge for permission to speak to Paul when he was brought in for a pretrial proceeding into the cage that he was, he was kept in while the proceedings were going on in court. And it was a, uh, it was an, it was a, a fascinating experience because it was a beautiful courtroom. The judge had on you know, snazzy judicial robes with with a with gold, uh, you know, a gold chain that sort of cinched the robe at the top. I mean, this looked like a nicer courtroom and a better robed judge than you'd find in the Southern District of New York or the District Court here. Boy, this 
this looks like a real courtroom. A complete, uh, it was a movie set. There was no justice, there was no trial. It, there was secret evidence. Paul wasn't allowed in the courtroom when evidence was introduced against him. The judge, by the way, did let me speak to Paul, uh, but they monitored what I was, what I was saying to him. Uh, we stood next to, he, I stood by the cage where he was and, and got, to, got to speak with him. Um, but I'm, the point I'm getting to, uh, Angela, is because the FSB handles him, they control him through his, whether he finishes his sentence or he's traded. So he was sent to IK-17 in Mordovia, labor camp, but he is under the thumb of the FSB. Hmm. And the consequence of that was after the summit in Geneva uh, in 21 when, when Biden met with Putin, um, the two leaders agreed that they would appoint officials, uh, an official on either side to negotiate further on, at that point it was Trevor Reed and Paul Whelan, uh, Brittany Griner hadn't been arrested yet. Um, and Biden designated me. Uh, and so I went to meet with Yuri Yushikov, Ambassador Yushikov, former Russian ambassador to the United States, now foreign policy advisor to President Putin. And I wanted to talk to him about a list of things. All of these, this was in the uh, July or August after the June summit, all the, the work streams that came out of uh, the Geneva meeting, and among them was detainees. And he said, John, there's, there's an issue. You, are you the person that we're supposed to speak to on, uh, on, on Whelan and Reed? And I said, that's what President Biden said. Mm, I don't know. I said, well, that, you can talk to President Biden. He's, he's the one who decided. I scheduled a meeting to talk to the Russian government about Paul Whelan, I was told that a senior FSB officer would lead the discussion. So we went, I went to the MFA, and it's, he's now become a fairly, well, at least for, uh, for those in, uh, in Russia who follow these things and, and elsewhere, Colonel General uh, Beseda was the FSB, senior FSB colonel general who was, I was supposed to negotiate with. So I went to the MFA, and again, I will invoke my favorite investment bank, Goldman Sachs. If you told me this was an investment banker from, uh, from Wall Street, I would have said, yeah, he looks it. He's, he's known as the Count, um, and he looks... Uh, like a million bucks, and he's probably got a lot more. <laughs> he probably than is that. right. Uh, he doesn't look like you know an F, you know some thug. Uh, he was glib. He uh, but he wanted. He was willing to talk with me, joke with me, talk about anything other than Paul Whelan. And so. We, he, Sergei Ryabkov was with us when we met, and it was hosted by the MFA. The FSB wouldn't let me near any of their facilities. They didn't want to engage with me. They wanted to engage with CIA and FBI yeah. because Paul's a spy. But another example of Russian humor, so I'm, it's, it's um, Ryabkov, Sergei Ryabkov, Deputy Foreign Minister, Colonel General Beseda, myself on the other side of the table, and I'm trying to draw... Uh, General Beseda out about uh, about Paul, and he's just not having any of it. He's looking at his watch, and finally he says he's he's busy and he has other. He's sorry, but he he's very polite, but he's he's got to leave. And um, I had other business not related to detainees to discuss with Deputy Foreign Minister Ryabkov. So Ryabkov and I are both solicitous of of the count, and he gets up. And uh, I said, I'm, I'm sorry, but Sergey and I are going to continue our discussions. That, you know, you're welcome to stay if uh, you know it's something like that. If you're if you're interested, but and he's uh, he just looked at me and he said, I'm FSB. I'll know what you two talk about. I don't need to be here for that. And he walks out. <laughs> so everybody's sitting around on my side of the mirror. We're like, ooh, <laughs> boy. Uh, so we ultimately had to establish a channel for the FSB, they would not engage. So I went, ultimately went back to, to uh, Yushikov and said, what's up? Yeah. He said, a guy like that 
won't talk to you. You make him nervous. He doesn't like diplomats. He's got to deal with, you know, the people he's used to uh, used to dealing with. So they treat Paul differently. Yeah. With Trevor Reed, later with Brittany Griner, they would deal with us, yeah. with me and others, but not for Whelan. Wow. Very, very interesting. Okay, I'm sure you all have lots of questions. Um, so I think we would like questions, and, and like one question each, not five, <laughs> uh, and, no, and uh, more than comments. But the floor is now open. I assume there isn't a mic to go around. Oh, you do have a mic. Okay, good. All right, so uh, I have one, or I have like three questions, but the last two are like very brief, yes or no questions, so hopefully you're willing to answer them. Uh, so, and can you also identify yourself? Yeah, so my name is Edward Sun. I'm a freshman in SFS, currently interested in pursuing international politics and security. Uh, I speak both English and Chinese, and one to two years ago, I started learning Russian. Uh, do you think that Russia will still be a major political international security powerhouse, or do you think another country will take place, and do you think my efforts are misplaced? And then these, last, these next two questions are uh, from, actually from a professor whose class I'm currently skipping to be here. Uh, <laughs> he, he wanted me to ask you whether or not you're still on Sergei uh, Lavrov's Christmas card list uh, after you've been the target of the Kremlin's bully boy tactics, uh, and also whether or not you think Putin is concealing a chronic illness. So. Uh, the answer to the last two questions are no and no. Uh, on the first question, absolutely. Uh, is Russia going to be relevant? Uh, absolutely. Uh, it's, uh, it may not be, uh, and, and Patrushov himself at one point said this to me. He said, we realize we're not the Soviet Union. You know, we're not a, a, an economic colossus of 350 million people. But we've invested a lot in our military, including in our, uh, you know, our weapon systems, and we are the rival, if not, you know, stronger than you are, United States militarily. Uh, and of course, they've got all that oil and gas. Are they going to be uh, a major player? Are you, uh, yes, are you wasting your time learning Russian? Absolutely not. Is it a hard language to learn? I know from personal experience, extremely. I asked Ambassador Huntsman, my predecessor, who's good with languages, speaks Mandarin fluently. Uh, he went over uh, with the goal of learning Russian, and in two years, he had regular studies, uh, and he said by the end of two years, he didn't even feel comfortable giving a simple dinner toast. I then figured, oh, I, I could go and, and try this, but I, why waste my time if Huntsman failed? And then I couldn't help myself. I just, I am so uh, fascinated uh, by, by Russian culture. Uh, I love Russia. Um, I took uh, language lessons. Uh, my lessons went uh, ploha, badly. Uh, but they only stopped when the war started. I didn't have time to do them anymore. Yeah. Okay. Okay, over here. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Omar Ahmad Badami. I'm a freshman in the SFS studying science, technology, international affairs, and Arabic. Um, with the Ukraine war going on, I noticed that um, the Russia conflict in Syria has dropped into the background a little bit, uh, at least in news reports. Um, has U.S.-Russian dialogue on the Syrian theater changed at all um, since the advent of the war? And what do you think may happen in that theater going forward? Well, it's, it may have dropped off if it's appropriate to say this now, uh, off the, the front page, I don't know if there are people don't read newspapers anymore. It may have dropped off the front page of American papers, but it's still enormously significant, including to our NATO ally, Turkey. Uh, I know it's a huge concern. I've had several friends uh, in the service, foreign service, who've served um, you know, in our, our unit that was spent time in northeast Syria. Uh, we had a pretty significant dialogue with, uh, with the Russian government, both at a political level. Um, Jim Jeffrey, who is a career ambassador, was our special representative for Syria and negotiating with the Russian foreign ministry. Uh, but we also had for, we had to be careful about how we phrased it, the military dialogue between was first General Dunford and, and General Gerasimov, and then further down the military chain. We had to describe it as uh, military deconfliction because we have 
Uh, it's been a dwindling number of U.S. military personnel with the SDF in northeast Syria, but uh, the U.S. military is barred by law from cooperating with the Russian military, and it really was deconfliction. Um, and it was a channel that uh, General Dunford, General Milley used before the war in Ukraine to make sure that Russian units and American units didn't come into conflict. The only time that happened, uh, when this was when General Dunford was chairman, Secretary Mattis was Secretary of Defense. Um, if you'll recall, I believe this was in February of 2018, uh, a Wagner element uh, approached looking to, to seize oil resources and, and oil uh, facilities, uh, approached U.S. military positions. Uh, through the deconfliction channel, we had direct communications with the Russian military, not with Wagner. And of course, back then, if I ever spoke to the Russian government about Wagner, I'd get a hand like this and say, look, that's not, we don't know what you're talking about. This isn't, this isn't, uh, you know, this is a, 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 is this a company you're talking about? What, what is it, Wagner? Didn't know anything about Wagner. But we were communicating with the Russian military very explicitly. It went all the way up the chain in our government to Secretary Mattis. We were concerned these were uh, heavily armed units approaching on the ground against U.S. military personnel, vastly outnumbering our small number of troops on the ground. And Mattis ultimately authorized uh, hel uh, helicopter uh, gunships from Iraq that came in and you know, we kept, tell them to stop, we're really going to do it, tell them to stop, and we kept getting acknowledgement from the Russian military, but the Wagner troops kept coming, and they were, I mean, I'm, I'm, it's horrific, but I mean, they were just massacred. These were hundreds of people who were, who were killed by the U.S. military, Wagner personnel. Um, you know, what that says about the, rela the relationship then or now between Wagner, Prigozhin, and the Russian military and Ministry of Defense. But our warnings never got communicated to those people on the ground, or if they were, they were crazy, uh, and they just walked into uh, a buzzsaw from the U.S. military. And I mean, this, it, they were approaching on the ground, so it, went, it, went, uh, it wasn't sort of an instantaneous there are aircraft approaching. It was over an extended period of time. So when I say there was multiple messages over hours saying, really, they got to stop, make them stop. We're going to kill them all. And Mattis cleared it, and, and we did. So um, to get back to your, your question, it's ex of extreme importance to the United States, the humanitarian issues, you name it. Ultimately, Mattis uh, quit in part over... Uh, Trump's decision back in the time, which he subsequently, he would make decisions and then reverse them and flip back and forth. But Mattis was so concerned about President Trump's decision to remove the U.S. military, abandon, in a sense, the SDF, that he quit. Over here. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, my name is Taiji Sasaki, and I'm a second year MSFS student, and I'm also an international student from Japan. I have a question regarding the um, Russia-China relationship. Um, do you think, how much do you think uh, China was better informed about the invasion? And do you think China had a better access to the Russian government after February 20, uh, 20, uh, 24th? Well, everything I've seen and from people I've, I've spoken to is that, uh, in fact, the Chinese government was surprised by the scale of uh, the special military operation. Uh, you recall that Putin went to the Beijing Olympics, met with Xi. Um, my understanding is that the special military operation was delayed so it wouldn't interfere with the publicity surrounding int public interest, global interest in, in the Olympics. I mean, somebody's got their priorities, right? We don't unleash a horrific war while there's an Olympics going on. Um, but I think they were surprised uh, by the scale uh, and even more surprised by the incompetence and the failure. Uh, and you know what they announced 
while Putin was with Xi, their, you know, their no limits partnership, we've since learned that there are limits. I mean, Xi has said on at least two occasions, the use of nuclear weapons in support of the military, special military operation, not a good idea. So it's my, among the reasons why I still remain convinced that, uh, that Putin won't use uh, nuclear weapons, even in a small-scale tactical nuclear weapons, because he knows how that he would lose what support he has left in, in Beijing and in Delhi. Hi, um, I'm Sam Rostow. I'm in the um, master's program in security studies. And um, Ambassador Sullivan, thanks for coming. Um, and I just had a question about um, what do you think about the future of the bipartisan consensus in Washington on Russia, the future of uh, the Republicans in the House, and do you see that as becoming an issue? Do you see the bipartisan consensus fading on Ukraine and other things? Yeah, thanks. I mean, it's a question that I've I've uh, I've talked a lot about with with friends and uh, and colleagues. Um, I think in the Senate, all the senators I've spoken to, the Republican senators I've spoken to, and there's there's there is a there is a solid bipartisan consensus in the Senate. I had a long several calls with Chairman McCall, the in, the the new chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. His views are, are completely, my views are completely in line with his. I think there is, unfortunately, um, a minority among uh, the majority in the House uh, who, if President Biden says black, they say white. If he says X, they say Y. I don't know that there's a lot of thought that goes into it other than if President Biden says we should uh, provide weapons or provide financial support for Ukraine, their immediate response is to disagree with what uh, a Democratic president says. I was brought up in a different era. People didn't, when I was a kid growing up, uh, whether it was uh, in the Nixon administration and the Carter administration, Reagan, Bush 41, you know, it wasn't that partisanship, despite what you might hear, partisanship didn't end, uh, you know, at, at the, the coastline, the Atlantic or the Pacific. But there was more consideration of the ultimate national interests. Uh, and it's it's something that I feel very strongly about. And I used when my Republican friends, I'm a lifelong Republican, say, you stayed and worked for Joe Biden. I said, I was honored to stay and work for President Biden as the US ambassador in Moscow. And the president asked me to, and I'm not gonna say no. Uh, I think you know our politics has become so toxic. There are some in, in Congress who they just, at least they may not think that the war in Ukraine is serious enough um, you know, maybe if there was something more serious, they would, they themselves would be more serious, but they don't understand the consequences for not just the United States and NATO and Europe, but for the world. If this aggressive war, as my, my former boss, President Bush 41 said, when Saddam Hussein, with grievances against Kuwait, you know, Saddam, they were indebted to the Kuwaitis. They share an oil field, a large oil field in southern Iraq, and Kuwait, Kuwait shares that oil field. I mean, he had grievances, and he also claimed that Kuwait was Iraq's 19th province. And instead of negotiating, he invaded Kuwait and plundered Kuwait City. And President Bush immediately said, this, this, won't, this shall not stand. This can't stand. And that's my view on what Russia did on February 24th. I, uh, I was willing to leave my comfortable perch on Mahogany Row as deputy secretary to go to cold, hostile Moscow because I was committed to negotiating with the Russian government. Uh, and those few areas that we have left where we could try to stabilize the relationship between the, la you know, the two nuclear superpowers on the globe but February 24th changed everything. You know, we thought that history had ended. It hadn't ended. And in fact, February 24th changed history. We can't have a permanent member of the UN Security Council launch an aggressive war against a neighbor, no matter what 
the historical justifications are for a triune ruse, whatever, when, when the swarms of troops, tanks, aircraft, and missiles cross that border to bludgeon Ukraine and its people, that's when, you know, we still need to talk to the Russians, but that's when the negotiations really end because they weren't serious about negotiations before the war and they're still not serious. And it is not just in the U.S. interest, it's in the global interest for those who are concerned about future peace and security in the globe that this aggressive war be stopped, reversed on terms that are acceptable to Ukraine for its security and prosperity. And I don't care whether it humiliates Vladimir Putin. This can't stand. So I'm actually going to take the privilege of asking the last question. I'm sorry we're running out of time. How do you think this does end? How do you think it's going to go on for a long time? What, how, do, how do you think it ends, and what are your scenarios? <laughs> So I was at an event at CSIS uh, some days ago and Secretary Mattis and Secretary Gates were there and John Hamry, the president of CIS, asked that question to Mattis and Gates and Mattis just looks at Gates and Gates says, geez, John, thanks for the softball uh, <laughs> question. Uh, you know what yeah, Secretary Gates said? Anybody who tells you that he or she knows how it's going to end doesn't know what they're talking about. I'll make some predictions, though. Uh, the violence won't end. There may be ceasefire, ceasefires. This is going to be, I've tried to think of analogies. Um, if you think about the violence in, uh, in Ulster, in Northern Ireland, at a very small scale, um, this is going to be a much bigger gaping sore of violence on the European continent for a long time. The Ukrainians, I met with the mayor of Bucha yesterday and the deputy mayor of Bucha. I mean, the Ukrainians, you know, talk about strategic miscalculations by President Putin. Boy, he turned a country of 44 million people, for the most part, into the most determined, not adversaries, enemies of Russia. So even if there is a ceasefire, which I hope there is. I don't want to see any more missiles blowing up apartment buildings in Ukraine, or for that matter, in Russia. But no matter what, the Ukrainians aren't giving up, even if, contrary to what I think will happen, I don't think that a renewed offensive by Russia is going to, is going to decapitate the Ukrainian government in Kyiv. Uh, never say never, but I just don't see that happening. Uh, that's the goal, right? To denazify and demilitarize Ukraine. The stated goals of the special military operation from which neither President Putin or any of his lackeys, Peskov, Lavrov, have ever deviated. They, they will change their tune on the rationale for why they're doing it, but their goals, the code to denazify and demilitarize Ukraine means eliminating the government in Kyiv and subjugating the Ukrainian people. That's what they want. And the Ukrainians are resisting furiously. And President Zelensky does not, will not concede an inch to Putin. But if he did, he wouldn't remain as president because his people are so committed to resist and reverse the special military operation. So I apologize to all of you who didn't get to ask your questions, but I please join me in thanking Ambassador Sullivan for a wonderful discussion. We are thrilled that you are at Georgetown. You're going to be around. Do you want to tell them about your Valdai West? Yeah. So, well, uh, Mikhail, oh, he's rubbing, oh. We have, we have conspired to organize the Valdai West Club, the discussion group for those of us who obsess about all things uh, Russian. Uh, and I plan to be on campus Tuesdays and Thursdays uh, afternoons when my office mate, <laughs> Professor Smith is not using her office. Uh, Tuesdays and Thursday afternoons, and I think, uh, Mikhail, we're going to do Thursday afternoons uh, for discussing 
you know, current events, current topics, whatever anyone wants to talk about concerning Russia, the war in Ukraine, et cetera, or anything else. Um, and I'm just, I'm thrilled to be here at, uh, at Georgetown. I told this joke, this was, I extemporized, it just occurred to me when we did the uh, retirement event, lovely ceremony for our distinguished uh, Professor Emerita, uh, uh, Professor Stent last October, I think. And there had just, that day I had just seen just, you know, this rhetoric that comes particularly from Medvedev is just over the top and we're Satanists, we're devil worshipers, we're, you know, this, that, and the other thing. And I remember, I just said, you know, I guess that's why I came to Georgetown. If I'm possessed by the devil, I, maybe the <laughs> Jesuits have some, somebody here who could could help me. I mean, it worked 50 years ago. I mean, Medvedev says I'm a Satanist. So uh, anyway, thrilled, thrilled to be here, even if I don't need an exorcism.